without further ado, I would like to welcome Amanda Prochaska from Wonder Services. Join me for this podcast. Thanks very much for joining me, Amanda. Thanks for having me. This is exciting. I was saying to you just before we started recording that you're, you know, looking very alert and awake and with it, bearing in mind it's pretty early and you're in Las Vegas, aren't you? I am in Las Vegas. I've been here actually since 2015. I told somebody that yesterday and they're like, wow, you've been there for a while. And I was like, well, I guess I have been. <laughs> so. I, I haven't been to the States for quite a while, but I was actually in Dallas last week mm -hmm. and I, um, I had a fantastic time. Really, really enjoyed it. Um, and I'm sure I'm sure the the thing is the same in Vegas, but I could not believe the level of air conditioning that is possible, even in extremely large buildings like the Dallas Cowboys Stadium. Yes, um, it's funny because people make fun of me all the time. They're like, you live in Vegas, but you wear like sweaters all the time. And I'm like, yeah, because it's it's actually chilly inside. When you go inside these buildings, it is uh, we'll just call it refreshing. <laughs> I was cold. Least. I was genuinely cold. <laughs> Yes. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> but no, I had an excellent trip. But uh, thanks very much for joining me. So mm -hmm. we're here to talk about procurement digital transformation. We've got some right. great topics lined up in the area. Keen to get your views on on how the market's progressing, certain things that we're mm -hmm. seeing in the market and what we're, what we're kind of looking for, ahead to. Um, but before we get into that, would you be able to just give a bit of background context on your journey through the procurement world? what you're doing mm -hmm. now with Wonder Services as Chief Wonder Officer, yeah. which I love. Thank you. Um, Thank you. <laughs> and, yeah, kind of how you got there, really, just a bit of a journey. Okay. I, I'll i I'll say that it actually legitimately started with the movie Beauty and the Beast. Oh, so here we go. Very, this is very... my kind of story. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a very long story, but I'll, I'll try to abbreviate the front end. So I fell in love with that movie as a child and decided to study French. I ended up getting a French uh, scholarship to pay for my school. And, but then I, I went into school and I was like, well, what am I, I, I just can't study French. Like, what am I going to do with that? Um, beautiful language, but I needed something else. And I wanted to go into international business. And the closest thing at the school I was going to was international political economics. So I decided to major in both. So that's like the starting point of, of this journey went through school I realized that a lot of the people in school were going into government and I didn't want to necessarily go into government. I wanted to stay in the business track. So I was a little confused about where to go with my career as I was sitting there as a junior and I was going to graduate early. So I had about six months to kind of figure out life. And I was going through a booklet. I kid you not. Like they gave me a booklet and they said, here are the jobs that you might be able to get with this degree. And it was alphabetical. So it started with the A's all the way through uh, Z. And um, I started through the A's, nothing looked cool. I went through the B's and I got to buyer. And I was like, I like to buy things. Who doesn't like to buy things? I had no idea what it was, what, you know, what a buyer does or anything. And so that night I was like looking on the internet and I, um, one of the companies that was close to where I was living was a French owned company. And so I was like, well, why don't I check their website to see what they have available for us? And so I did that and, uh, they actually had a buyer one position open. So I applied a week later, I was interviewed the day after that they offered me the job and really the rest has been history <laughs> since then. So that's, that's how I got into procurement. That is a fantastic origin story. And yes. I, I, I like the fact that you actually, in terms of what you studied, it gave, gave you clear job opportunities. It reminds me a little bit of when I was at university, not such a great story, but I studied environmental biology, so ecology, kind of environmental science, effectively. And and back in the day okay. when I was studying, I was like, "This is going to be huge. It's all about saving the planet. It's really important." And uh, but it was a bit early. It was a bit early in the you know back in those days. Yeah. And, and I remember one of my friends. Right. right. One of my friends was studying economics, and he basically produced an article that was outlining statistically the percentage increase against the average salary that your degree would give you. And his was like, you know, plus 50% or something like that. Mine was like minus 7%. I thought, hmm, didn't really think this one through, did I? But it's it's great to see how that path took you there. So so you went in as a buyer. Yeah. And then and then how did that progress? Yes. 
Yeah, so I, I started as a buyer and my, my first project was a large change. We were actually changing from um, in-person travel agents to online booking tools. So from day one, I was usually working on some very large change uh, projects. And that was what I loved about procurement because you could go into an organization, save some money, add some value, change the way that things were being done for the better and, and move on to the next thing. So I fell in love with that aspect of procurement. And um, then I got into three SAP deployments, <laughs> uh, multiple procure tech deployments, insourcing and outsourcing, uh, merger and acquisition, leading those uh, uh, mergers most of the time. I didn't do as many divestitures, but anything that was going on in procurement that didn't relate to like the day-to-day -day operations, I became the lead for. Um, setting strategy, et cetera. So progressed through my career. I was, uh, my last corporate gig was actually at MGM Resorts and that's what brought me out to Las Vegas. And I had wow. my dream job. I was working for my mentor at the time. I built a brand new team from scratch. We were going through a large change of not just technology, but our processes, our talent, um, how, what we want to accomplish in, in procurement, how we organized ourselves. So it was like a complete transformation of the organization. It was so much fun. Um, but then I got to the like point where it was, it was pretty good. Like we, we transformed a lot and we we're moving more and more into uh, operations. And I looked at my husband and I was like, well, um, I could go find another transformation to work on, which would be fun, but we would move the family. And I, I started like doing the self-reflection. I was like, I really think there's a need in the marketplace for the skills that I bring, which is mostly focused on change management, user adoption, how we want to organize strategically to get all of that done in procurement. Because I kept on hearing 30% success rates. Actually, KPMG just uh, this week came out and said 50% are uh, of digital transformations are successful. Um, so it's somewhere in that ballpark. It's still not good, right? Like if we're investing all this money in digital transformation and we want to make an impact. And when you look at the numbers, user adoption is usually what is setting people back from being successful. It's not the technologies, it's the adoption of it. So I was like, you know what, I'm going to go after it. We're going to start Wonder Services. Um, it wasn't actually even called Wonder Services at the time, but <laughs> We're going to start this adventure of helping as many procurement organizations be successful in their digital transformations. And that's what Wonder Services is all about. It's about unlocking digital success for procurement. And so one of the things I want to come on to later are mm -hmm. some of the challenges in procurement in general, but obviously the challenges in digital procurement. But that's a that's yeah. a fascinating stat that, that KPMG is saying 50% of digital transformations are successful because Mm -hmm. There's a lot below the surface with that, isn't there? I mean, what what constitutes yeah. successful and for all those that are unsuccessful, you know, what was the thing went wrong with them and how many of them never started in the first place? Right. And like your original point, how do you even define success? Sometimes I walk into organizations and I'm like, what does success look like? And they already have approval for the project because there was an ROI, but I'm like, but that's not just what success looks like. Success is a much bigger picture than that. So we actually spend a lot of time up front with leaders typically to understand how we're going to measure that success at the end of the day. So when we do look back three years later, four years later, whatever it might be, we can say, were we successful or not? Yeah. So, so yeah. if we take a step back a little bit and just look at the yeah. current procurement landscape, in terms of digital transformation, what are you seeing in the market and why do you think you're seeing these particular patterns and trends? Okay, so there's a couple of things. I'm going to I'm going to talk just procurement in general first, yeah. and then I'm yeah. going to get into uh, digital procurement. Okay. So it um, and actually a, a good friend of mine kind of brought this up. He said, you know, at, at first we were there to save money. And then it became to save the company, which is risk, looking at risk, understanding what risk might be. And now we're being asked to save the world, right? And I was like, that is so true. And you take a step back over my career, which is you know 20 plus years now, that is, that is totally spot on. I mean, 
we we've transformed so much as an organization and i think one of the challenges that leaders have right now is getting our heads around that right we know we've been talking about esg and we've been talking about how to save the world but have we really reimagined how we're getting the work done and the tool sets that we're using to get that done some people are starting to do that some people are not but it, it feels like some leaders come to me and they're like it just feels like work is being piled onto us. And those are the moments where we can truly transform the organization and what we do and think about things differently. We're giving, we're being given that great gift, that catalyst to create the change. And um, we need to have leaders who are going to walk through that door and, and really think about things differently. So that's the, 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 I would say the foundation of some of my comments on the digital transformation side, because I think we're ripe for a complete transformation of how we think about digital uh, procurement. When digital procurement started, it was taking physical processes, right? So how to get a rack to a purchase order to an invoice being paid, and we, we took that digital. In this day and age, it's really about how do we reimagine the work with the tools that we have to create a difference in the world. So. That, that's really what I want to get after. So AI is going to be huge. Um, you have a lot of uh, like, like new intake thought and philosophy around how we manage work through the procurement uh, organization and beyond. I think that that intake alone is going to transform a lot of what we do if, if we apply it correctly. We're going to see a lot more tools that are specific to certain areas to optimize those areas. I mean, I already tell people right now, I mean, there's well more than probably a thousand different procure techs out there. And I think that's going to continue to expand and we're going to see, continue to see a lot of investment in the area. Uh, we just had a huge announcement from a procure tech last week or earlier this week, I can't remember $44 million investment and they're, you know, still pre go to market. So that is a huge amount of money going into the procurement space. So I, I feel like, I think there's going to be a lot of cool stuff happening <laughs> in the next couple of years in this space. Yeah, I totally agree with you. Um, we're going to, we're exhibiting at the uh, Digital Procurement World Conference in Amsterdam. Oh, yeah. Next week, week after, week after, I think. Um, yeah. And you're right. The procure tech sector has, has grown so rapidly. Um, I think buyers are a bit confused in they some are. ways. Um, it's, mm -hmm. it's a bit of a, um, a kind of maze to navigate. Um, and, you know, incumbent technologies sometimes don't help the process in terms of what they might have sold in they can do versus what's actually yeah. possible or realistic. Um, but it's a fascinating area. And like you say, it's an area that's ripe for transformation because it's so immature compared to, for example, the marketing uh, function yeah, and marketing technology. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I it's it's going to be interesting what I see that is going to happen because people have made investments in the end-to-end -end technologies, but even though those end-to-end -end technologies don't do great in all spaces, right? So you, we're going to see kind of this hybrid model continue to develop where they're going to continue to leverage their base end-to-end uh, -end and then layer on the different point solutions where there's weakness per company, right? Because everyone has a different need in different areas. They might be more services heavy or, or manufacturing heavy. So it really depends on what the need is. But I think eventually there's going to be a migration off of the core technologies and into a space where you have an in interconnected web of different point solutions that meet your needs. Yeah. So I mean it's not going to happen overnight for sure, but I think there's going to be an evolution there. Yeah, I think you're right. And and that's certainly the view that um, kind of frontline industry commentators like Dr. Eloise Epstein from Kearney, mm -hmm. certainly mm -hmm. her view and, and the way that she kind of maps out the market. And I think it is a confusing market at the moment. There are a lot yes. of technology players out there. Um, however, that will kind of, it will organize itself to a certain degree in the sense that, you know, these heavily funded startups or maybe not so heavily funded startups will either sink or swim. You know, what is it? Yeah. Um, four out of five startups don't make it past year two or something like that. So I think the the market will shake itself out 
in a, in a similar mm-hmm. way to, to how other markets have evolved. Um, and it will become more obvious which areas require that specialist expertise, which parts of the process need, um, you know, specific technology to 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 make that um, to get that to where it needs to be. Um, mm-hmm. And connecting it all together is a fascinating thing as well, but quite often less complicated uh, in my experience than people might initially imagine. So it's a bit of a journey of discovery for for organisations, um, and I guess that's where people like yourself can really you know, open their eyes in terms of the conversations and, and your knowledge of what's going on in the market. Yeah, and, and it's it's interesting from my point of view, because I talked about user adoption earlier on. When you get fragmented systems, the con- one of my concerns and part of why I was uh, motivated to start Wonder Services was because you, you can get these wonderful spot solutions, but you need to be really strategic about the user experience. Like how, how does a user move through that landscape to get what they need at the end of the day? Um, and so I think there's going to be a lot of work around that intake is going to be part of it. But, um, but I think it's also going to transform procurement into, instead of the, the, the conversation for procurement has always been come to procurement, right? We need to be engaged early, come to procurement. Everything is around, we need you to come to procurement. But I think what is going to happen with technology is that we're going to go to where the people are and be there next to them as they're doing their work versus requesting them to come to us. So that I think is going to be a really cool way to kind of reimagine what we're doing in procurement is let's not talk about come to procurement. Let's go to where they are, where they're transacting today and um, involve us in that process through a technology so that we can have that interaction where we need to be, um, where procurement needs to be entered into the process. That's really interesting. I've not kind of looked at it in that way before. I like your, I like your yeah. point there. I mean, yeah. I, was gonna, I was gonna ask you, you know, a follow on question of, in terms of, you know, firstly, we, we've looked at where you see the market now and the key things that are going on, but The Mm follow-on to that is really what do you see the next steps being? What are the future trends? And I think that's that's an interesting one. You know, if you see that Mm -hmm. as being a future pathway. Yes, I do. I do. I think a lot of what procurement is going to be focused on is going to where the people are. (laughs) It's it's really fascinating because it's it's ultimately about weaving the value that procurement can deliver into just the 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 life cycle or or the natural. Uh, workflow that people are operating under or or yes. maybe where those workflows kind of are going to um mm-hmm. how do you see that how do you see that happening how are procurement going to get closer to where the people are actually operating at the moment what what do you see as the kind of different routes to that well i i think there's going to be the way that i look at it is actually through technology so there's there's already technologies out there let's just say uh you have an organization that works in Slack, right? And they're working in Slack on a, on a project. We'll just say a marketing team's working in Slack on a project and they decide they need to order something. Right in Slack, there's going to be, you need to order something, you know, here's where you go. And then it's going to take you through that ordering process and direct you to where you need to be without having any previous knowledge of that process. Right. And that's the huge struggle. So I'll, I'll give you an example. So I was having a conversation with a consulting firm and a client, and they, they were going through a process of identifying buying channels. And they actually identified 15 buying channels as an organization. And that's probably not uncommon. If you, if you take a step back and you look at your own organization, there's probably 15 or more different buying channels that you're, you're asking your organization to go through. But if I take that a, a step deeper, a buying channel could look like this for an end user. It is, I I have a service and it's under $500, you need to go this direction. If I have a service and it's over $500, but below $10,000, here's a different route that you're going to need to go. If it's a service and it's over $10,000 and doesn't have a contract, here's the different route you need to go. And right now, and those are just three examples, right? Right now, we're asking the end users to know all of that. 
right? It's a, it's but a at lot. the end of the day, yeah, at the end of the day, when you just want to buy something, do you want to know what all those channels are? No, you just want to get something purchased. Like I'm sitting in sales, I'm sitting in marketing. I just want something. I just want to purchase something. That's all. I don't want to know the 15 different buying channels. So I think this technology is going to help us get to the point where they, the end users don't need to know. It's just going to direct them where they where they need to go and get a purchase, and it's going to be seamless and um, hopefully have less and less black holes in procurement versus what we have today. Yeah, and it comes back to what you were saying about how critical the intake side of it is in terms yeah. of making that process of getting on the right pathway, making it intuitive. Correct. Correct. And then even, even like how we work through a contract or how we work through, um, oh, services, con yeah, services contracts are the most <laughs> complicated ones. Everyone loves a services contract. <laughs> not, right? worth the so not worth the paper they're uh, not stored on half the time. <laughs> so, but for a, for a marketing organization or someone in marketing to go through that process with procurement today, there's, there's a lot of delays. There's a lot of, like I consider black holes and there's not enough insights to make sure that that contract is a great contract. So with AI, we can start talking about AI with AI. We can leverage that to make sure that we not only can workflow that in with intake, but we can now leverage AI to make sure that that is a, an easier process through and through. How do we gather requirements? How do we get that into a statement of work or an MSA? How do, how do we make sure as we're negotiating that we have alternate clauses that we can leverage that are already pre-approved so we can streamline that and we can make sure that we not only, because traditionally we've had to put those clauses in ourselves, but I think AI can be leveraged now to say, here are, 10 different alternatives to that language that you can negotiate that are within the parameters of what you set. So I think there's just, there's going to be a lot on the AI side too that can be adopted seamlessly into our process to improve our efficiencies and to the value that we're providing to our clients. Yeah, it's it's unbelievable what can be done with AI in that context. I mean, you know, yeah. one of my one of my good friends just constantly gets chat GPT to write rude poems about me for him and then he sends me the poems and they are quite they are quite funny they are quite funny but you know if you ask chat gpt to write a funny poem in if you know from the point of view of x type of person with x type of subject it's incredible what it can do um mm -hmm. if you ask it to write an article it will make stuff up if you ask it to you yeah. know interrogate a um a podcast transcript for example it will make stuff up but if you if you are specifically guiding it towards something like a uh, creating a scope of work, you know, I know firsthand from the stuff we've done around scope IQ um, mm -hmm. within our product, it's very well geared towards that. On the legal side, that's kind of like a bit of a next step. It's not our process is more around scoping the requirement than necessarily the the legalese. Um, but it has very very effective uh, application context within that scenario. Because it's much mm -hmm. more information based, much more um, fact based. It's got so many comparisons to look at to to really understand. It's just ridiculous the level of detail you can ask um, a large language model to put together around a requirement. It's just the inf the information it can provide in terms of its accuracy. It's not necessarily going to go boom. Here's a hundred percent perfect scope of work, but if you if you're tailoring it to work in the right way and in the same way that we look at it around creating a scope. We have very specific question and answer that we push back and forth via their API. So it's not mm -hmm. you're not just using the raw chat GPT. You're you're tailoring the response and making it easier for the end user to just put in a simple two or three sentences. And on the legal side, surely the same must exist in the sense that if an organization or a tech provider is tailoring what they're asking of the large language model mm -hmm. to push it into that legal context, you're going to reduce the margin for error significantly. And and it's yes. that kind of it's those wrappers around or or the ability to communicate with the AI effectively, which sounds weird. Me saying that I'm just listening to myself saying it sounds weird, but a lot of people <laughs> will try and interact. I won't say talk to. A lot of people will try and interact with 
chat GPT in the same way that they would just ask something of Google because that's no, how, that's that's how, how they're used to operating. Yeah. But but with the education around that and with some specialism, I totally agree with you. I think there's massive things that can be done that aren't actually that that aren't there to take people's jobs or you know or or, or it's it's just a, to a tool. Yeah, and in a tool that right now at least I think it's going to get better. It gets you eighty percent there. Yeah. Right. It, it's like it's a it's a sprint at the beginning to get you eighty percent there, and you have to fill in the the, the next twenty percent. So I'll give you a story of what I was doing last week. Um, I recorded 75 videos, short form videos that were right. like maybe two to, to five minutes long. Um, and then leveraged chat. I took the transcript of those videos, leveraged chat, and now we're creating all kinds of different content around it, right? That's in written form just from the videos that were recorded. So it, it is it is an amazing tool that I think can be applied so many different ways within procurement um, to increase our relationships, to drive innovation, to decrease our uh, cycle times within procurement of what, the work that we're trying to achieve. Yeah, and it's interesting when you, you're talking about user experience because user experience always used to be something that particularly as a tech provider, you know, how good is the user experience within your tool? But the interesting thing we're looking mm -hmm. at now is Ultimately, user experience is a cross is a cross platform scenario. So you need to yes. you need to be looking that that cross platform user experience adds a whole new layer to it. Um, but there are some really smart ways that the organizations are making that making that work. Um, I've seen some great examples of it. And actually, as mm -hmm. I said earlier, sometimes it's not as complicated as people first think. And certainly, you know, incumbent tools like teams slack etc and also some of these new uh cool intake uh intake platforms yeah. are certainly mm -hmm. helping that process yeah i i 100 agree on that and it, it's um it, it's a cool time to be in procurement because of all of that like i i think that you know as our scope has changed so dramatically the tool sets have also come around to support that scope and now we have to marry the two together to make sure that not only are we achieving the value that is expected of us, but that we're creating the user experience that is expected within organizations so we can move quickly, we can be agile. Um, if anything, the last several years have taught us that agility is truly important within procurement. So there's you know that breakdown of we, you know, this very rigid process and more flowing with the business is, is going to be a key to our success. Yeah, and I think you mentioned earlier about what the kind of core platforms that people have in place at the moment, source to pay, mm -hmm. procure to pay, um, right. kind of workflows, they have the scope for additional granularity to be added underneath them. Um, so so whether they mm -hmm. are the you know master supplier record, but there's some additional, you know, supplier criteria being looked at around ESG, for example, on a more gradual level by a specific platform. Or whether you know in in services, for example, you're handling your MSA and your contract lifecycle and risk management within a source to pay platform. But if you call off a statement of work, you're going a level below. Or if in 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 the buying of goods and materials, you're punching out in an Amazon type scenario. Um, mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of scope to just add in that additional layer because ultimately it comes back round to the data side of it, which is another area that is 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 massively changing. Yes. No. And and I. I still don't know. This is a big question mark in my mind. When it comes to data, data is going to be the connector of all these systems, right? It, it's what's going to feed the engine of, of this platform working. But there's, I think, a debate and a healthy one that needs to be had it, had within procurement is around what what is that, like the, the main record that we're going to build this off of? Is it going to be the supplier? and build around the supplier and that relationship with the supplier and contracts with that supplier, the spend and how we're, you know, who's using that supplier in the organization, what's their ESG scores, all of that. But then I've also heard the whole bit debate around, you know, it's going to be around the contract and the contract is going to have all of that information surrounding it. I still don't know which way that's going to play out, but I think there's, when it comes to that, I think there's just going to be this foundational connector point Oh, um, for the data so that we can see a, a holistic picture of whatever activity was going on within procurement. 
I personally, like I, I originally thought it was going to be supplier, but then when I heard some people talking about contract and I was like, well, that, make, that could make sense too. So I'm not sure which way it's going to go. That's a really, really interesting point. It's got my mind whirring in the stuff that we've done around supplier performance. I'd say it's kind of both. Um, and if you think of the data, yeah. so you've got the data that is associated with that supplier, but that supplier's data is always going to be associated with the contracts they've been engaged in to deliver materials, goods or services, whatever it might be. So I almost see the data as like this kind of cloud of information um, that is is relevant to the supplier, but the performance is related to their delivery against the contracts. So it feels like it's, it's potentially like a crossover area. And I think the way that yeah. data is the way that data is handled more now is is in this type of scenario where it is a cloud of data and insights are pulled and manipulated in different ways. But ultimately, what it comes down to is capturing the data, which in mm -hmm. in some cases can be extremely difficult, where processes kind of dip offline, or for example, contracts are not stored digitally. I mean, some some organizations would regard the digital storage of a contract being a scanned PDF sitting in a file. Okay, it might be in a PDF. That doesn't mean it's digital. <laughs> so so that is, it, I, I feel like with some companies, and it'd be interesting to know what you see in this area, it feels like there's a long way to go. Even if they've got top level systems in place, their data can still be quite scarce. Yeah, and it has been for, I, I, it's been a challenge since I, I started in procurement. I, I remember going to a, a conference, my oh gosh, it was probably around 2014, and they were talking about how because we don't have good data, we can't tra digitally transform because we don't have that layer of foundation to build off of. And I got so frustrated, got so frustrated about that conversation and the seat at the table conversation during that conference that that's what actually launched me into LinkedIn and writing blogs and doing all of this work because I was like, oh, we can't, we we got to, we got to get off this. Like, we got to figure it out. Either we're asking the wrong question or we just like the answer to the questions that we've been asking for the last 20 years. Um, and so when it comes, when it comes to data, I think it's, um, I like the, I think we have enough data where we can, we can do what we need to do today. Right. However, there's going to be a, a very large shift in our thought process around how we connect all of the dots. And I think that that lake kind of that cloud concept is interesting. But like if I were to walk into an organization today and just randomly pick a supplier out of a pot, right? Here's a, here's a vendor number that you have in your organization. Tell me, tell me everything that you know about that, that supplier with just looking at data today. Like, are we connecting to that supplier record, the contracts, the uh, their scores, their risk scores? Can we quickly pull up their spend? Can we look at who's using that supplier and how often? Like, I, I think that's going to be, we, we have all of those elements for the most part. There's some organizations that don't, like you mentioned on the contracts, which I'll get to in a little second. But I think we need to start thinking about connecting the dots. And then once we understand what that landscape you want to create looks like, we can start filling in the holes of where we do have holes in that landscape. Does that make sense? It, it does. I, 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 okay. In my, in my head, it kind of feels like what you need to be able to do is grab a supplier. And when you pull that supplier closer to have a look at them, it drags all yeah. of the data points that are connected to that organization. Exactly as you say, the top level data points around that organization and then the data points around what they've been doing for you and with you. And I think the connecting the dots thing is interesting, particularly as at the moment, there are more dots being added. Yes. So, so it's quite a fluid process, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And it's something that I think organizations need to be strategic about and start thinking about, okay, if I have this landscape, how does it look today? And how is it? how do we want it to look in the future? And then that might be part of your driving factor around what technologies you want to even to invest in, right? What data are you missing in that picture and, and how can we acquire it? Or do we, do we have it today, a scanned PDF contract? <laughs> and we have a great starting point, but it's not really giving us the data that we need. How do we get to the data um, in the future and think about that differently? And that might drive an investment within procurement to get that done. 
yeah definitely i the yeah. the other thing about the kind of scan contract uh almost a meme isn't it but uh <laughs> um is just the fact that contracts change contracts engagements are fluid particularly in some areas or uh, in you know there, there are particular areas where, that, where that's more likely to be the case than others which are particularly cut and dried but i think it affects a lot of procurement and that's where it comes into this whole thing of measurement of performance and you know dare i say i'm not even going to go as far as saying roi but just in terms of that measurement of performance it's it's a constant update of what was promised versus what was delivered and what was promised might actually change along the way and there might be factors within the organization that are hindering that supplier from delivering or asking them to deliver more and these things need to kind of drag along tag along don't they to use the 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 legal contracting parlance they just need to be pulled along with it and taken into yeah. account because it's it's more complex in a lot of cases than just here's the original contract that was signed and in a PDF and actually we don't we there's nothing known further than that. I I have a theory around contract lifecycle management products, the historical project products. They never really worked because as soon as you let's just say I have a PDF that I've uploaded into this tool, and then I had to manually put in the master data around that contract you rightly said that relationship is always evolving right it's it's changing it's morphing it's adding on it's maybe we're deleting some some we're changing terms whatever it might be that master data was it touched at that point when something changed most likely not right and so like i would go <laughs> go into clms like i would start at a new uh, corporation and I would go into their CLMs and I'm like, who's Johnny so-and-so who's the contract owner of this, this contract. And they're like, well, Johnny hasn't been here for five years. And I was like, oh, oh, good. This is really useful data. <laughs> like it doesn't. So I, the, the cool thing about where this is going though, is that I think with the technologies and actually leveraging those documents and creating real life master data around it, pulling out the attributes, understanding if you actually have a um, assignability. That's another one that used to drive me nuts. Like we go in and we merge with another company or we acquire another company and I have to hire a consulting firm to go through my contracts to see if they're assignable. Like really, I have a, I have a contract management tool, but of course that wasn't part of the master data that was asked. So now I have to hire someone. Well, now there's technologies that do that for you. They'll pull out, here's the assignability of, of the contract. Here's that report that you have. And again, it might not be a hundred percent correct. You might still have to spot check some stuff today, but it gets you a lot further in, in the conversation than previously <laughs> the previous technologies were uh, being able to provide. So I'm excited about that space in particular. I think there's there's a lot of innovation happening in the contract management space and how it's tying into supplier performance um, and how we can get better insights from the information that is being gathered in that process. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah. So I, I want to come on to talking about or, or getting your viewpoint on some of the challenges in procurement um, when they're looking at moving forward with their transformation, digital transformation, mm -hmm. Um, making those steps but before we get yeah. into that I'd just okay. be interested in your view what you were talking about earlier with regards to the implementation of technology and the kind of strategic approach to it in terms of having linked best of breed systems and all that sort of stuff mm -hmm. I, it's quite interesting I always, I, I always find it fascinating understanding people's viewpoint on the kind of process versus technology um, kind of conversation in the sense that uh -huh. some companies will try and take technology and just basically bend it to fit a bad process. And some companies will do a digital transformation where it's just all about the technology. What What's your view on the kind of balance there? <laughs> okay, so I actually just posted about this a couple, a, a couple of weeks ago. Like, should we be looking for technologies that can meet our process needs or should we be looking at a, a technology where like the, the old moniker is, you're going to adopt best in practice, best in class processes to meet the needs of this particular technology, right? So what is that? I got I actually got like a 50-50 split on the comments around that, yeah. by the way. So some people are like, 
some people are thinking, hey, technology is the way that it is today can bend to our process and our process is going to reign king where other people are like, no, no, no. Like the technology is going to dictate our process. I I personally think I I used to be one of those people that are like, the technology is going to dictate our process. But I think we're at the point today where we can be a little bit more flexible around that and allow a process to um, kind of more dictate what the technology looks like. Now, here's the caveat to all of what I said. <laughs> You don't want to get crap faster. And that's what I tell people all the time. If you have a bad process, the technology is not going to fix it, right? So if you're going to go the route of having this process dictate what the technology looks like, you need to make sure that your your processes are fantastic. And I think that what, what's going to happen with these technology firms as you're going out and you're going and consulting with your clients around how things should be implemented, I think there's going to be a little bit more focus on what that process should look like in the future um, and bringing those best in class options to the table so we can really look at that process, but it's not like force fitting it into the technology. The technology can be, um, I don't want to say manipulated because that's not the right word, but you know, configured. molded into, yeah, yeah, configured into the right uh, way of working for that business. So even this morning, like uh, I was on a conversation with one of my clients and they have a very particular process that is very particular to their business and the technology doesn't have a way to support it. Yeah. Um, which I is unfortunate. Like we're trying to put a, a process that's core to their purchasing process into a system. And it's like, we're really struggling to figure out a way to get it done. Yeah, I had a really interesting conversation yeah. with with um, Adam Brown from from Maersk, and he's their yeah. you know head of all of the digital procurement stuff that they're looking at. Um, and in if you look at that shipping sector, in terms of the problems that they need to solve, price variability, time zones, all the distribution side of it is hugely complicated. And mm -hmm. actually, he's building a great team that are doing some of those things for themselves. So I yeah. think I think there's going to be a balance, and I certainly from our point of view. We are, you know, we are constantly being educated by our customers and prospects as well. And I think it is essential to have that flexibility. But by the same token, there needs to be um, the, the tech companies need to make sure they're not just automating a bad process for the sake of it to try and keep that customer happy. Um, yeah. And the client needs to make sure that they're not just approaching it by just saying, oh, let's just get some tech that's going to solve everything where they maybe haven't addressed the bigger issues behind the scenes that that are uh, kind of uh, covering up loads of problems. Yeah. And we actually, when we go into organizations, we actually, the old kind of saying was people process technology. Um, we've actually started peeling back that onion a little bit because it's actually more than that, right? So people process technology, sure. But policy plays a big role in, in that because not only procurement policy, but finance policy, other policies that we need to consider across the organization. You have data, which we've already talked about. Like, what's your data layer? What does that look like? Are we trying to transform it? Where where do we want to go with it? Metrics, it's a big driver a lot. Like I just had, I had a conversation with a client the other day and I was like, why why don't your buyers have DPO targets? If, if they had a DPO, like a day, day's payable outstanding target that they could go after, it would solve actually a lot of your process issues. So what type of metrics are we holding our, ourselves accountable to? How are those going to transform? You have culture, you have organization, right? So how are we organizing the work? How do we get the work done? And how does the culture dictate what we can and cannot do um, in this transformation? And I don't know, how many did I go through? I think that was eight, but I'm not sure. All, all <laughs> I, can say is, I will be keeping an eye out for the acronym that ca can capture that lot because that's brilliant. It's really good. So yeah, okay. you start you started with kind of like that's that's a challenge I I lay lay down for you. But people process yeah. technology, policy, data, culture, and organization. Um, yeah, and metrics. Were, yeah, that's yeah. Uh, yeah. It's it has it has to be more sophisticated as the procurement function evolves, as procurement becomes more digital, as we push into greater granularity and and more of a focus on 
um, using data for strategic action rather than just being transactional. So I think it makes mm -hmm. a lot of sense that maxims like that, that always kind of made sense maybe 10, 15 years ago, need to need to move with the times as well. Yeah, absolutely. And when you think about the user experience and change adoption, you have to look at all those different factors to really, truly really be successful. It's not just a technology implementation anymore. Like you need to understand how that's gonna fit into the bigger picture and all of those different elements help you think through what that bigger picture might include. Definitely. So yeah. So obviously there are some challenges around things like data, um, existing processes, maybe cultural, uh, you know, mm -hmm. uh, kind of lack of desire to change. Um, what other challenges do you see for within the procurement, within procurement teams, within businesses that are stopping them from moving forward with, uh, you know, trying to transforming their procurement function? Okay. I might not make a couple of people happy with my comments on this one. <laughs> so everyone's been forewarned on this. I think the largest challenge is leadership within procurement. Right. Um, and kind of, I don't want to call it old school, but maybe stuck in your ways, stuck in the path. Like there, there's been so much change within procurement. It's almost hard to get your, your head around. So I, I feel for these leaders. I don't, I don't, they're probably, they're not bad people or anything like that. It's just the, so much has changed. It's just trying to get your head around it so that you can think strategically about how you want to move forward. So I think there's, there's a huge blocker here and I'm going to use an example. And I, I like to use this example a lot. If you were to guess how many invoices are sent to businesses electronically, what do you think that percentage is? Invoices that are sent to businesses electronically. Um, mm -hmm. I'd like to think it's in the kind of like, you know, 50 to 75 percent, but it's probably going to you're probably going to tell me that it's far lower than that. I'm going to guess it's probably. It somewhere between... Yeah, globally, 30 percent. OK, now here's the thing. We've been working on e-invoicing since. I started in my career and probably before that, right? That was one of the like the lowest hanging fruit when you talked about digitalizing procurement. It was trying to get your invoices electronically. Um, I don't think that's a technology issue. I think that's a willingness to adopt the, the technology issue from a leadership standpoint. I think you're right. And do you know what? I, I was, yeah. it reminds me of a, um, a panel discussion I saw at a procurement conference last year i think it was early last year maybe um and there were people from pretty large organizations and there was one person in particular who was talking about the importance of this transformation and it amazed me that some of these other senior leaders were kind of saying well it's not all it's cracked up to be you know there's the the good old stuff that we always should have done and need to stick to and one of the things that really jumped out to me was how on earth if you're one of those procurement organizations that's stuck in the past how on earth are you going to recruit good people? Because they're going to come in and go, okay, so you, so I'm I'm a young person who's used to using tech in everything that I do in my life. Mm -hmm. And you're coming in here and you're asking me to work with these archaic processes. Good luck retaining those people. No, yeah. Well, so I'll give you an actual story about that. That, that was one of the driving factors of the transformation that we did at MGM because we were actually using an AS400 green screen to purchase items. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So you get a new college grad that we spent so much time and effort. I mean, we had wonderful programs developing relationships with universities and getting like the top talent to come into the organization. And then we would turn around and sit them down and say, you need to learn all these codes to do what you need to do. <laughs> like all these transaction codes and all this stuff. And they're like, well, I've never seen a green screen before. Um, and they would be completely confused and frustrated. And so that was a challenge. Like we we would bring all these wonderful people in and then give them a technology that just didn't, didn't meet the needs. So that was a, a huge driving force behind the change that we did at MGM. So anyway, it was, it was pretty funny. I remember just sitting there looking at these kids like, they're going to have like no idea what to do. <laughs> I didn't even know what to do. Yeah. I, like, yeah. So, yeah. um, so anyway, I think that's a large challenge. It's things are changing so quickly for the leaders to get their heads around. Like 
what, how, how do we want to re reimagine procurement and, and do this uh, effectively and truly buy into that the, the technology is an enabler of their success? Um, and to be open to those new ideas, because there's so many new ideas out there and ProcureTech is just vastly complicated now because there's all kinds of different options out there, but to be open to the possibilities and explore, there, there will be a solution out there that can solve for a problem that a procurement leader is having today. So, 100%. so that's, yeah, that's, that's number one. Um, the the other problem that I see is that procurement is still, and I don't I don't know if it's because of a lack of technology investment previously or the increase of work level, but everyone that I talk to within procurement is overwhelmed today. Like I I haven't met a procurement person that's not overwhelmed in a very long time. And when you're getting into that overwhelmed state, do you have time to think? Do you have time to strategize? Or are you just reacting to the day to day that's coming in? like fire every single day. And so I think there is a large, a large, it's not a distraction, but it's hard to be focused on what the future looks like because this, the day-to-day -day is just so overwhelming for procurement uh, professionals. Uh, and I don't, I don't see that slowing down. I mean, the risk alone, supply chain worries, inflation worries, geopolitical issues going on across the, uh, the globe. I, you know, climate and all of that layering <laughs> in. I mean, I don't see this slowing down. So it's going to be foundational for those leaders who are in charge of those organizations to really be strategic about where they're spending their time and how they're carving out enough time to focus on the future and what what their organization is really going to be able to uh, accomplish through their what they have today and uh, additional investments that they might need to make in the future. Do you think that's um do you think that's in any way a lack of investment from organizations in their procurement teams? Yeah, I mean, I hear all the time, yeah, you know, we're being asked to do more with less or more with what we have today. Um, and like it, leaders have used the words like being piled onto, like we just are getting piled on with work, but we're not getting the investment. Some sometimes I think that's a lack of ability to influence. In the organization so procurement has created a lot of value in the past several years in in just managing the supply chain crisis alone but how are we promoting that how are we showing that back up to leaders how are we building our story around that um even like i think procurement professionals would benefit from being trained on how to pitch ideas because I know just speaking from experience from being a procurement professional and then going into sales, my eyes were completely opened <laughs> around how much skill I was lacking in procurement versus the skills that I could have. So it's my personal journey, but I think a lot of procurement leaders are probably in that same boat. Like we're in procurement because we're not marketers. You know, we're, we're, we're in procurement because we're not salespeople. Um, but I think you, I think procurement would benefit a lot from learning those skills so that we can promote our organizations and get the investments that we need. Yeah, because because otherwise it's a bit of a chicken and egg scenario, isn't it? I mean, if, if a procurement function is, um, you know, highly digital and has a huge amount of data at their command, then that suddenly gives them a lot of power. You yeah. Know, the, the CFO, the C-suite in general are going to be very interested in what that data is telling the organization and how they can use it to mit mitigate risks, um, you reduce costs, you know, increase value and all this sort of stuff. So, so getting to the point of being able to bring those insights to bear, um, it's, it's, it's a, it's a point that people have got to get to. They, the, the, the change makers within procurement teams, like you say, they need to be able to put that pitch together to get somebody to take the risk on them. Yeah. So what you just said is exactly right. So I tell, I tell leaders all the time, it's not about you. It's about them. So when you go into a CFO's office, they're going to want to hear what you just said. What they're not going to want to hear is, I need to spend analytics tool. Yeah. Right? It's a completely different story. Um, and what really, at the end of the day, what does spend analytics get you? I, I would argue that that's a very limited view of what you need a view on. But what you just talked about was the value to the company, the insights that you could drive. You could even commercialize that 
at a certain extent, if there's a way in the marketplace to leverage that data to offer a new line of business in your organization, I mean, the, the possibilities are, are really awesome if you think about it, of where you could go with that. But that selling to a CFO about the business impact versus trying to talk about what we need in procurement. Yeah, and it it yeah. kind of, I mean, in terms of problem solving approaches, are there any other particular areas that you see as like major parts of that? Um, because the, um, it, it sort of, I was, sorry, as you I was just going to say, yeah, it kind of leads on to one of the the last question I had for you, which was around mm -hmm. recognizing value in procurement and how to measure that. It's quite a, it's quite a, a a significant topic. But just just before we move on to that. In terms of mm -hmm. other problem solving approaches, are there any other particular kind of key areas that you see um, that, as important? Um, I think I'm trying to think if there's any other ones. We already talked about going closer to the the customer. I think there's there's going to be a real need and a shift within procurement organizations, and it's it's a problem today is that we're not as customer centric as we could be, as in with your stakeholders. So really embedding the organizations into the work that's being done day to day. We talked about that from a technology standpoint, but I think there's also a need and a barrier to success really of being very inwardly focused versus being focused on the business and how we can help our customers um, and our stakeholders be successful at the end of the day. So I think that's a shift in mindset that it has, pulled, it has held us back in, the, in procurement in the past technology might help us break through that. We'll, we'll see how that goes, but, um, but I think that has been another one that I would bring up. Um, but outside of those, I, I, I'm not thinking of anything else that I've, I've heard from clients or in my recent engagements with procurement organizations. Well, um, <clears throat> conveniently enough, those points all have some bearing on how procurement are measured. Um, yes. in terms of their ability to serve the customer, the ability to be more outward looking at how are you serving the business? What does this mean strategically? Um, mm -hmm. When you look at how procurement teams are measured at the moment, it's pretty basic, I would I would put forward. Would you agree with that? Yeah, it, it's it's funny too, because I we talked about at the very beginning and throughout this, how procurement has transformed, right? All the new responsibilities that procurement has, but at the end of the day, we're still looking at cost savings. Like, and I know some people have like supplier diversity spend targets and stuff like that. But if you ask people in procurement what you are measured on, the first thing that they say is cost savings for the most part. Well, particularly when particularly when the economic conditions are difficult as well. It's suddenly yeah. there's, there's other things that might be priorities and they could suddenly get deprioritized. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. So I... I think we, and, and people will say, we're never going to get away from cost savings because it's it's what we're here to ultimately the baseline of what we do. But I think there's even a way to think about cost savings differently. And my experience at MGM kind of opened my eyes to this. And I, um, we actually started in certain categories measuring gross margin improvement, right? So if you just look at that, gross, what, what goes into gross margin? You can increase your revenue, you can decrease your costs and your margin looks much better, right? Um, and the, the one of the categories was wine, okay? So wine, nobody wants a cheap, cheap bottle of wine, right? So cost savings around wine is not what the customer wants. It's not, it's not what we're gonna make money off of. So we actually looked at how, how do we buy a better bottle of wine and price it more effectively so we get a better gross margin. Does that make so it totally shifts the conversation. Yeah, Does that make it, sense. It, it totally shifts the conversation into yeah. more of a more of a grown up business conversation rather than just a face value, um, computer says no type of thing. And I, and I think <laughs> I find it quite interesting looking at cost savings because even if you just break that down, you know you've got the kind of hard cost savings that are this was the budget, this was the contracted price, or this was how much it got la cost last time. This is how much it cost this time. Um, or this is how much I was quoted and this is how much we contracted for, mm -hmm. um, which of course have their value if they're measured correctly. Um, yeah. But procurement, so say for example, there's a there's a sourcing event, procurement add their value 
if the organization is sophisticated enough for procurement to be able to add value around that sourcing event to create a saving against, for example, budget versus contracted. So great. That mm -hmm. procurement person has created X amount of savings that goes towards their target. Yeah, but they get a gold star. You get a gold star. <laughs> but then post-contract, depending yep. on what happens post-contract, which oftentimes, if you look at areas like services, for example, often that's not measured very effectively. So if, yeah. if post-contract, that agreement is going completely off track, there's a massive overrun, there's a big extensions on it, you know, it just continues on and on and on, or it just spirals out of control. How much are procurement worried about that? And how much are procurement measured on that? And there's a, there's kind of a question of like, how much should it be their problem? But it's, it's still mm -hmm. part of that life cycle because you've contracted with a supplier to deliver something for a certain cost. And maybe they haven't, or maybe they've just, they, 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 uh, there was a bit of a um, poetic license with how much the costs were quoted and contracted, and it just gave them scope to have massive cost overruns that the business had to bear. But actually, it's still looking like you know a cost saving at the front end. So th there's those side, those parts of it are, are far more nuanced. Yes. Okay. So, gosh, I have all kinds of thoughts around that. <laughs> that. Um, so a couple couple of thoughts is uh, I I think the way that procurement is going and more likely a lot of our metrics will be around third-party management, right? Because we're being asked not only to look at the cost savings up front, but how the risks that are associated with that relationship and the how the, the supplier is performing and the ESG scores and, 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 right? So I think it's going to be kind of this more, the shift to more management of that back-end relationship. However, today there is a healthy struggle between uh, that just that upfront and then letting it go, and it's now owned by the business, right? There's that, and and I think it comes down to what we're incentivizing our teams to do, because if we're incentivizing our teams just to do that upfront contract negotiation and the theoretical budget versus cost, and we say that's towards their goal and there's nothing else, they're not going to concentrate on the back end. Right. Now I've tried in previous lives to, to track actual cost savings in the indirect space. It is not very straightforward. <laughs> right. And so there's, I think there's a, there's, there needs to be a change there to understand what the bigger picture is of that relationship and understand what those other metrics might be around performance of the contract, um, adherence to original budget, original project timelines, et cetera, and gathering that information to create that more well-rounded perspective of how we are measuring the success of a procurement manager, director, et cetera. So, but until that changes, people are, people are incentivized by what they're measured on. And do you think when you talk about procurement kind of dipping out of the process at a certain point and handing it over to the business, mm -hmm. do you think that sometimes within businesses there's a collective sigh of relief where the buyer is thinking, great, that's procurement out of my hair. I can just get on with it now. Yeah. Because <laughs> it feels to me like, you know, if you if you look at the concept of how do you, how do procurement engage with that greater life cycle to ensure maximum value from that supplier engagement, that interaction, they mm -hmm. they need to be involved in that full process, but they need to be involved in a in a position where they're helping, not hindering. They're not the police. <clears throat> they're not in the way. They're, they're helping the buyer, the stakeholder, work towards the overall business goal of the organization. I feel like oh, it ties back. Right? It, it ties back really, really nicely to what you were saying about getting closer to where the person is doing business. Mm-hmm. And, and truly understanding what the business is trying to achieve. <clears throat> I, 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 get, I give this example a lot. You walk into a marketing organization and you start talking about cost savings. They're not going to want to hear it. Like most marketing organizations don't want to hear that to begin with. So it's before we start touting about what we can do, let's learn from the customers and try to understand what they're trying to achieve and then help them achieve it. Right. And that's not just cost savings. It could be value from those third party relationships. It could be, um, uh, you know, driving innovation uh, across the board, depending on what those targets are. There's all kinds of 
now that we've been exposed to so many more uh, value drivers within procurement, you can walk into an organization, understand their strategy and find multiple ways to add value in those relationships. Definitely. It's it's always about that deeper yeah. look, isn't it? About a bit more of a considered approach. Um, but obviously, if you can take best practice and you're continuously building on the approach that you take, for example, when you're going into new customers, mm -hmm. um, there's, a, there's a wealth of information that you're bringing with you. And I think the more that people can have these types of conversations, I just think it's great to just get the information out there and get the conversation going because, um, you know, a lot of people are, have these questions in their heads um and and maybe they're kind yeah. of in their current mode within their current organization they can feel a little bit stuck in terms of well what are other people doing and um, and and what are the opportunities to change yeah absolutely i'm going to circle back really quickly to the co comment you made about uh, service providers and this is just something that for procurement professionals who are listening today to keep in mind when recessions start to be talked about or if they're occurring a major strategy that consulting firms do is that they will undercut their price, <clears throat> knowing that as they move forward with the implementation, let's just say they win it, that change orders are going to ensue. It is, an, a, <clears throat> as, as I went into the consulting world, I learned so much about what, what companies were doing. And, and it's like, it's just a known fact in, in consulting, that that's the strategy that the large consulting firms deploy, is that they'll cut down their, their cost in hopes of change orders later on to, to make up that difference. <clears throat> so procurement organizations are like, yay, we got a great cost reduction on this consulting firm versus budget. But the play isn't that upfront contract, it's the change orders on the back end that is, you know, a relationship with the business. If procurement's not involved in that, it's, you know, out the door, right? All, you can say you save money all day long, but the strategy is totally opposite of that. 100% agree. And it's like that comparison of yeah. rate card of consultancy A versus consultancy B, you know, how long is it going to take? Um, where, where yeah. people, where, and, and in some projects, it is very difficult to work towards very clear deliverables, but you can iterate exactly in the way you would with a, um, a sprint in an agile process, for example, mm -hmm. the most important thing is that those agreements are being updated, constantly updated as these iterations occur, because what's yeah. promised versus what's delivered can change over the time, over time. And that can be totally legitimate in the sense yeah. that the company might not really know what they're asking for to start with. And they work it right. out as they go along and they need their supplier to be able to facilitate that process. Or there might be reasons that the project has been delayed within the organization, but it's the organization's fault, not the supplier's fault. Mm -hmm. So absolutely, it's all about, um, yeah. that, that's the only way you can get to understanding value. And it's the only way you can get uh, get to understanding true supplier performance. So um, I think it's a really exciting opportunity yeah. um, for organizations to look at, along with all the other cool stuff that they can do to make their procurement uh, function more effective and therefore add greater value to the business and therefore be held in greater esteem and seem as more valuable and more powerful mm -hmm. within that organization and therefore hopefully get more investment um, and that will yes. allow the, um, greater maturity of the function in the same way that we've seen in other functions that have uh, have been around longer and certainly been through that digital transformation maybe uh, maybe a few years ago yeah you hit it on i mean i don't know how i could say it any better so, <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you hit it on that Excellent. Well, listen, thank you so much. I really appreciate you taking the time to have a chat. I've really enjoyed that conversation. Um, I'll be keeping an eye on your content. When, uh, yes. when, are your, when, when and how is your video content going to come out? Oh, so it's going to come out over, over social media. So follow me on LinkedIn. So that that's going to, to happen. I'm also now on X, which is oh. a new venture for me. So there's going to be more content out there. But if anyone wants to follow me on LinkedIn, that's where most of my content is. Uh, I, I don't dispersed, uh, used, and, That's and hopefully of value to the organizations. Yeah. Brilliant. Excellent. Well, listen, thank you so much, Amanda. I really appreciate it. Um, have a good rest of the day. And uh, yeah, thank hopefully you. we'll catch up again soon. Yeah, likewise. Thank you for inviting me. This was a pleasure. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. Yeah.